Hello everyone. My name is Mike Zhang. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the MetaSAM package in this video. The MetaSAM package conducts meta-analysis using a structural equation modeling or SCM framework. It uses the OpenMX, Levan, and SAMplot packages at the back end. The R code and the reference files of this presentation are available at GitHub. Please refer to it. In this video, I'm going to focus on how to use the MetaSAM package to conduct analysis. Please refer to the relevant documents for the theories behind it. In the first part, we are going to present a MASAM or meta analytic structure equation model to, con to combine correlation matrices and to fit structure equation models on the average correlation matrix. We will illustrate the procedures with an example in the th theory of plant behavior. There are five variables. They are attitudes, subjective norm, perceived behavioral control, behavioral intention, and behaviors. So this is the theory. Uh, this is the model we are going to fit. First of all, uh, we may load the package and also the data uh, frame. Uh, the primary Data are the list of correlation matrices and their sample sizes. So here are three of them, so they're listed here. These three correlation matrices. Please note that they are also missing data and they are represented by NA. And here are the sample sizes. And uh, we also extract the variable names for future use. The first thing for us is to check the missing pattern. So we can use this command. And we can see for some variables there are 23 studies, but for the behavior there are only six. And we can also check the sample sizes on each the total sample size on each cell. The first part is to conduct a two stage two stage structural equation model. We are going to use uh, random effects model. And the syntax is like this. Random, so this is the object we are going to save uh, for our analysis. We include the data, the sample size, and then the method we specify random effects model. And we assume the random effects are independent because we may not have enough data to estimate the full variance covariance matrix. And we can get a summary so how, here is how to read the output. The first part are labeled intercepts 1 to 10 are the average correlation matrix because there are five variables. So totally, we have 10 correlation coefficients. Then the other one labeled with tau 2, they are the variance covariance matrix. And we can also get the heterogeneity, the i squares on each correlation coefficient. For ease of our reference, we can also extract the fixed effects component and arrange them in a way so we can see this is a pooled correlation matrix. So we have five variables. So this is the average correlation matrix consists of a five by five. And we can also extract the variance component by extracting the random part. And moreover, we can also use the variance correlation function to extract the full uh, uh, variance covariance component. Please note that uh, the off diagonals are all zeros because we assume these random effects are independent. Okay, then now we can fit the structural equation model. To specify the model, we can use a Lavan syntax like this. So we save it as model one. And we specify the paths coefficients. Since we are analyzing a correlation matrix, the variances of the independent variables are fixed at one. And we also allow the predictors to be correlated. And here's the graphical representation of our model. Then we can use a Lavan to RAM function to convert it into RAM representation. 
it is because the MetaSAM package only understand the RAM representation. There are three matrices to represent a structural cushion model in RAM representation. The first one is the A matrix. It represents the, re the path coefficients, including regression coefficients and factor loadings. The columns represent the independent variables, and the rows represent the dependent variables. For example, this one, uh, BI on ATT, it represents uh, the path from ATT to BI. And there's an also another S matrix which represents the symmetric part, for example, the variances and covariances. And we can also see for the independent variables, the variances are fixed at 1. And finally, there's an F matrix to indicate which variables are observed. In these examples, all four in these examples, all five variables are observed. Now we can use it to fit our model, our stage two model, and get the summaries. So for this part, the outputs are quite similar to standard structural equation models. We have all the labeled uh, elements. Moreover, we also have various goodness of fit indices. For example, the chi-square of the target model, the DF and the p-values, and also RMSCA, and is 95% CI, and also other fit indices. Moreover, we can also plot the model to get a, some sense how it looks like. When we are using structural question models, we can impose constraints to test various research questions. For example, in this case, we may want to test whether the path coefficients from the independent variables to BI, the mediators, are the same. So we can use the same labels. And this is our model. BI on X, it means from the predictors to BI, we assume all of them are identical in these three paths. Now we can convert it into the RAM representation, and then we fit it. And when we look at the output, all of them are the same because we force them to be identical. And we can get the usual chi-square, statistics, p-value. And moreover, we can also check the output graphically. So these three paths are all the same, 0.29. Finally, we can also ask the question, is it statistically different from a model without imposing the constraints? Since these two models are nested, the models with constraint and model without constraints, then we can use the ANOVA functions to compare these two models. And in this example, the chi-square difference test is about 35, and the DF is 2, and the p-value is very, very small. Then it suggests that we shouldn't impose constraints on these three paths. Another advantage of using the MetaSAM package is we can use it to calculate, calculate various functions or parameters. For example, we may be interested in the R squares on the mediator and dependent variable. And we can also want to calculate the direct effect and indirect effect, which are functions of the parameter estimate. And we can also use a LICO based Compton interval to get the 95% Compton intervals on these functions. Okay, so let's see how to do it. First of all, we can label each uh, coefficient. So it makes it easier for future calculations. So we label all the paths. Secondly, um, we can also label the error variance. Okay, so because we know that uh, since all variables are standardized, R squared represents 1 minus the error variance. So we can calculate the error uh, the R squares on BI and the R square on the BH by using one minus the error variance. Moreover, we can also define various indirect effects and also the sum of the indirect effects, there are three paths, and then the direct effects and then the total effects. Okay. So this graph so
shows us all the paths with the labels and then we can use them to calculate the direct effects, the indirect effects, the total effects, and then the R squares. Finally, we convert it into the RAM model and in the outputs we can also see the actual computations which will be run uh, in, in the functions later. Then we can refit it, but in here we need to make two minor changes. First of all, we need to uh, use the diagonal constraint equals true because we want to estimate the error variances. Secondly, we want to get the interval type with the LIGO base content interval. And then finally, we can run the analysis. Then in the output, we can see the message the 95% content intervals are now based on the LIGO base statistics. And then this lower bound, upper bound are all based on the LIGO base content interval. More importantly, we can get some extra outputs, for example, the R squares on the BI. The estimate is 0.46, and then the 95% Compton intervals red R is 0.39 2.53. Similarly, we can also get the R squares on the BH, and then for on the various indirect effects, direct effects, some some of the indirect effects. The two-stage SCM is quite useful to conduct the analysis when there are categorical or continuous moderators. We may use the one-stage Mason approach to conduct the moderator analysis. Let's illustrate the procedures with the percentage of female as a moderator. In the data set, is represented by female. First of all, we need to do some data transformation because we need to add the moderators into the data as well. Then we can use the correlation to data frame function to convert it into a data frame. And then secondly, for the percentage of female participants, usually we center the data to get more stable results. So we can center the data here. Then here are the, uh, these variables, female. And we can see there are some missing data here. Then we can create an indicator to indicate which rows to include in the analysis. It is because when we run the analysis with a moderator, we may want to compare against a model without moderator. We need to make sure that the same data set are used. So when there are missing data, for example, these few rows, we have to remove them. By using this indicator, we can remove it from both the Model, models with and without the moderators. In the first step, let's run a model without any moderators. So we feed the structural equation models using the old one stage approach, and then we just label as no moderator. The same, the RAM one, the data frame, and then the subset rows to indicate which rows to include. The outputs are almost identical to the two-stage approach, so we are not going to discuss it any further. And we can also check the graphical output, which should be similar. Then now we need to specify our model with a moderator. Okay. And let's take a look at the A matrix. So these are the paths that we would like to model with uh, females of the participants. Then to create a matrix to indicate which lay a parameter to model, we can use the create moderator matrix, and then we are using the A matrix, and then we can also see in the output, so these five paths would be models. Okay. And sometimes we may not want to model all of these five paths, then what we can do is to remove the others as zeros. For example, in this matrix, if we are going to use it in our analysis, then we, what we are going to model is just the path from PBC to BH, where the others will not be modeled. Okay. Now we can fit the model by specifying our RAM and then this moderator. 
and also to remember to include the subset rows. Okay. Then in the outputs, this few lines, what we can see is they are from the A0 matrix, they represent the intercepts. Then the other ones, A1, they represent the slopes. Okay, so let's see how it looks like. But before interpreting the results, usually we would like to compare the model with and without the moderators. We can use the ANOVA functions to compare these two models. So the DF is 5, meaning that we are comparing 5 coefficients. And then the chi-square difference is 6.6, .6, the p-value is 0 0.25. In other words, we don't have enough evidence to reject the models. It means uh, the moderator, the females, the proportion of females participants does not moderate the paths. As an illustration, we can also extract the A matrix. So this A zero matrix represents when the females is zero, then these are the estimated paths. And then the A1 represents the slopes. It means when the female percentage increases one unit, what's the expected change on the regression coefficients? And this one, A1, uh, when we compare to the previous chi-square test, we have noticed that it is not significant. Uh, the MetaSAM package also includes other uh, functions, especially one important one is to calculate multivariate effect sizes. Sometimes it's quite straightforward and there are standard formulas, but for other models, they are less uh, easy. And then the MetaSAM package provides some useful framework using the SCM mod modeling framework to com compute various effect sizes and their sampling variances and covariances with the delta method. So let's look at two examples. The first one is what we call multi multiple treatment studies, MTS. It is used when there are more than one treatment groups and they are comparing to one control groups. And um, Glaser and Orkin, they derived formulas to calculate standardized mean differences and the sampling covariance matrix for multiple treatment studies under the assumption of homogeneity of variances. And the MetaSAM package makes it more flexible because we don't need to assume homogeneity of variances. Users can control um, the assumptions. So let's look at how we can do it in in a um, SCM framework. In this figure, we there are three groups in these figures. The first one is the control groups. So in here we have one observed variables y, and then we have the means, which is represented by triangle. So this is the mean, and then is variance. Then we have two treatment groups, and then we have the, the observed variables, and then variances, and then the means. Okay. And we can calculate standardized mean difference according to the definition. It is the mean difference provided by the uh, pool standard deviation, okay, so the sigma. Okay. So we have two, okay. but now it depends on assumption. If we assume homogeneity of variances, then we can impose a constraint that all of these three groups, they, have, they share the same common uh, variance or standard deviation. And then based on this definition, then the calculated standard time mean differences are based on the homogeneity of variances. But on the other hand, if there are reasons to believe that the variances may not be the same, for example, the clinical groups or normal participants, then in this case, we can use the control group as the standardizers. Then we can also calculate the standardized mean differences without assuming homogeneity of variances. So let's see how to do it in the MetaSAM package. So uh, for ease of reference, reference, so we label which groups are the control, treatment 1 and treatment 2. So we have three uh, the sample means for uh, here, and then the variances, 
and also the sample sizes. So there's a SM DMTS. What we need to do is to give the means, variances, sample sizes, and then we specify homogeneity. In this case, we assume homogeneity of variances, and then the two standardized mean differences are these two values. And then we have a variance covariance matrix. How about if we don't assume homogeneity of variances, then in the homogeneity, we, are, we use the argument none. Okay. Then now we have a, another version calculated, and then also the sampling variances and covariances. And in these versions, we don't assume homogeneity of variances. Once we have calculated the effect sizes and sampling variance covariance matrices, we can use them in the multivariate meta-analysis. Then let's consider another case. It's a multiple endpoint studies. So multiple endpoint studies means that there are two outcome variables, for example, mathematics and language. And we have two groups, control group and treatment group. Again, Glaser and all can they derive formulas to calculate standardized mean differences with the assumption of homogeneity of covariance matrix. And the SCM approach released this assumption. And let's look at this figure. So here we have a control group. We have two effect sizes. The first one, let's say, is mathematics. The other one is language. And we have the means observed means. And then in this case, we decompose it into the standard deviation. And in the variances, all of them are fixed at one. And then we have the correlations. Similarly, we can also apply the same model to the treatment group. Now, if we want to calculate the standardized mean difference on the first variables, the first outcome, we can use this definition. Okay. And essentially, we can also do it for the, on the second uh, effect size. Okay. So since we are using a structural equation model approach, we can impose constraint to assume that the, in these two groups, the data are homogeneous in their variances and covariances. Or we can impose homogeneity on only the correlations, but we allow the variances to be different. Or we don't need to impose any constraint. And then we can use the control group as the reference groups to calculate the standardized mean differences. So let's see how to do it in R. We have two variables, mathematics and language. So this is the first group, the means for the first group. And then this is the means of the second group. And we have the Co covariance matrix for the first group and then the covariance matrix of the second group okay and then also the sample sizes then we can use the smd mes functions to calculate the standardized mean differences between these two groups so one is on the mathematics the other is on the language and we can assume homogeneity of covariance matrix and then we can get the effect sizes and then also the sampling variance covariance matrix. And we can also only allow uh, the assumption of homogeneity of correlation matrix, but we don't assume the variances are the same. Then we can get a different version. And finally, we don't need to assume anything. And then we use the control group, the first group, as the reference group. Okay, So by using uh, three different versions, it allows re researchers to check the sensitivity of the assumptions. So it means usually we assume the data are homogeneous in terms of covariance matrix. How about if the variances are different, then we can use the homogeneity of correlations. And then in the worst case scenarios, what happened if we don't make any assumptions? Then we can use this version. And researchers can check how robust they are. So in these two examples, we are limited ourselves to specific models. 
but sometimes researchers may want to create their own model and calculate effect sizes based on that model and use it uh, for meta-analysis. So uh, let's illustrate with our previous examples the theory of plant behaviors. Let's just take a one sample correlation matrix. So we have five variables and then the sample size. Okay. And we are fitting the same models. So now uh, we are going to extract the sum of the indirect effect and also the direct effect. And we want to use them as effect sizes in our meta-analysis. Okay. Also, we illustrate this example, but it doesn't mean that we should do it because a better way to do it is to summarize the correlation matrices and then to fit the structural question model in the later step. But in here, we use it to illustrate the power of using this approach to calculate various effect sizes. So now we just calculate the indirect effect and then direct effect and use them as two effect sizes. So we can show the model. Then to get the indirect effects and direct effect as effect sizes, we can use the calculate effect sizes function. We provide the model and then the correlation matrix and the sample size. Then we can generate the, the indirect effect is 0.22 and then the direct effect is 0.08. And also the sampling variances. And if you have a list of these effect sizes, then we can conduct meta-analysis based on them. Uh, in this brief tutorial, we have only illustrated a few functions that are served for others in the MetaSense package. For example, the meta functions for the univariate and multivariate meta-analysis. And then the meta-3 functions for the three-level meta-analysis. There's also a meta theme functions to fit univariate and multivariate meta-analysis, which allows missing covariates to be estimated with the full information maximum likelihood. Moreover, there's also an indirect effect to calculate standardized and unstandardized indirect effect in mediation analysis. That's all for today.